Um, and while the lecture is being loaded, I just want to uh, say that uh, having spent actually very many years of my life on both sides of the Atlantic, I would uh, very much like to thank the organizers for the inspiration and the great effort to hold this meeting. Uh, when I went on a journey many years ago to a divided Europe, Germany was just about to start fecal or cop blood testing in the national screening program. And of course, I didn't know that. I was fresh out of college. But uh, I was convinced that in our modern age, societies around the world would find themselves facing increasingly similar challenges. And sooner or later, the benefit of exchanging experience and working together to solve common problems would prevail. And uh, I think it's been a very positive experience over the years in Europe, seeing how uh, these barriers have broken down. And now, actually, the continent has become invite, uh, uh, together. Um, now, when I went there with this conviction, I didn't know that uh, improving cancer control through implementation of effective screening programs is actually one of the areas where the need for international collaboration and cooperation is perhaps most evident. And uh, thus, uh, I'm actually very grateful for the invitation to be here today and to share with you some of the experience in developing European guidelines for quality assurance. And I'm also very grateful that there are many people actually on both sides of the Atlantic. Some of them actually, two of them sitting here at this podium, uh, but many of you also in the audience who are contributing to this effort as contributors and reviewers and authors. And uh, I appreciate that very much. Now, in the available time, I can't go into great detail. Uh, but I would like to comment on some of the main features of these European guidelines for quality assurance. And uh, I hope that this introduction and this discussion will leave you with uh, those of you who are not yet familiar with the guidelines with a fundamental understanding of some of the basic aspects which I think are different from what is commonly uh, used in the United States. And um, perhaps in this way, uh, this will set a fruitful discussion in motion, which in the end, indeed, would lead to more widely available colorectal cancer screening. So thank you again for the invitation. Now, just to introduce you a little bit to Europe, I'm sure actually most of you are quite familiar with it. Uh, it's become a rather big place, the European Union. That's not all of the European countries, but it was recently uh, expanded and, uh, to 27 member states. And at the present time, there are about half a billion people in the EU. And in the age range, commonly uh, referred to uh, by experts as acceptable for colorectal cancer screening, um, there are well, well over 100 million people at this time. Now, uh, one couldn't talk about the European guidelines without talking about the Council recommendation on screening. And um, this recommendation I think was not just a coincidence that it was established shortly before the EU was expanded. Many of those new member states have very high rates of colorectal cancer. And in fact, at the time, there was not much screening going on. And so this council recommendation was just not uh, to recommend to the member states uh, unanimously from all the health ministers uh, to implement cancer screening. It was actually a number of uh, recommendations on how to implement cancer screening programs, how to maintain the quality, and how to reach appropriate decisions from the point of view of those responsible for the population. Now, again, I can't go into everything, but there are a few fundamental aspects which, uh, which are also core to the European guidelines. Um, uh, the first being that cancer screening programs should be implemented, of course, uh, in an evidence-based manner, but particularly uh, fundamental to the European concept through a systematic population-based approach and with quality assurance at all appropriate levels. Now, I'll come back to those points a little bit. I just want to show you the, uh, the tests, the evidence-based tests recommended in the annex. 
and to point out that although fecal occult blood testing is currently the test recommended at the European level, in fact, there is a lot of endoscopic screening and a number of endoscopic screening programs currently running in the EU. Uh, and um, I don't want to dwell too much on these numbers, but just to say that uh, the order of those tests had nothing to do with the importance. In fact, they're all important, as we know. But at the moment, there are about uh, half a million, uh, pardon me, a quarter, of a, a quarter of a million people who die every year due to these three cancers in the EU. And more than half of them, about 150,000, actually di are dying of colorectal cancer. So that it is a very important problem. Uh, the other main concept in this recommendation from which one can actually deduce most of the other recommendations is that cancer screening programs should be um, uh, implemented according to best practice and, of course, according to European guidelines for best practice where they exist. And the last point is that in this recommendation, which is not a directive and it's not a law and it actually has no real binding character, but which is a unanimous health policy agreed by uh, 27 countries, uh, it has had tremendous impact. And one of the reasons why it's had an impact is that already at the highest level of the EU institutions, there is a quality loop. And this quality loop says that one should report back to these institutions to what extent uh, screening programs have been implemented and uh, one should consider at the highest governmental level where perhaps changes need to be made. And this has already happened. And in fact, in June last year, the Council of the EU has already adopted uh, some additional recommendations. So now, again, in the available time, very briefly, this is the current status with the uh, European screening guidelines. Um, uh, the, the ones uh, which have been around for some time, breast and cervical, first appeared in 1993. Uh, all of these guidelines are developed in a collaborative effort involving uh, experts, uh, staff involved in implementation of screening. In recent years, more intensively, also advocates. Uh, and uh, it's always a pan-European effort. Uh, the breast guidelines more or less led the way and uh, helped to develop the concepts a little bit more intensively than in the area of cervical screening. That's why you see uh, the breast guidelines have been updated quite a few times and expanded. Uh, very recently, also the cervical guidelines. The colorectal guidelines should be published in September or October of this year. And um, just a few of these basic principles, which I think uh, are rather evidently related to, um, to these basic recommendations from the council. Um, uh, but again, uh, I think you've probably heard a little bit about this already this morning. Uh, screening is applied to predominantly asymptomatic populations. We're not talking here about um, the familiar risk or the hereditary risk we just heard about. Uh, the, com the council is referring to screening in large segments of the population. Um, the needs and concerns of the healthy, normally healthy people who attend screening, uh, the vast majority are significantly different from those of patients. And because the vast majority of these uh, literally hundreds of millions of people attending all of these uh, screening programs, um, are actually, at the moment they go to the screening, uh, not affected by the disease. Uh, only a few, relatively seen, will have a health benefit, even though the number adds up uh, when you look at the whole population. And because of the large number of people who don't directly benefit, uh, one has to keep in mind that all of these other participants are also exposed to the risk of screening. And therefore, the risks, even if only slight, may collectively shift the balance between harm and benefit. And that's why in a screening situation, one has to be particularly careful about the quality. And one of the second basic aspects is that because of this, one has to keep in mind that one can lose the quality of a screening process at any step. So it's just not enough, as we did early in the German screening program, to try to promote participation one has to constantly try to improve the quality in performing the screening test, in doing the diagnostic workup, and even in the treatment of the disease. And one should keep in mind, I believe this is the European approach, that um, 
uh, the screening, of course, will only lower the burden of disease in the population if it is actually implemented. And obviously, it won't be implemented many hundreds of millions of times if it's not effective, if it's not cost effective, and if it's not affordable. So very briefly, I think the time is running out. These are the chapters in the uh, colorectal guideline, which is under development. You can already see here that the entire screening process is taken into account. And um, uh, again, some of the fundamental concepts. Uh, I would just like to, in closing, uh, mention two or three uh, things which, uh, which you will recognize from the other guidelines, the multidisciplinary aspect, the importance of standardizing uh, pathology procedures. And in closing, I would like to refer to this report in which um, the extent to which the recommendation has been implemented was recently uh, uh, analyzed and published for all the 27 member states. And you find in this report an explanation in greater detail than what I could give you today why the Commission and the Council has uh, chosen to emphasize the population-based implementation process. So this will be the last slide. Uh, population-based means that all of the people in the target population are personally identified and personally invited to attend the screening program. And one of the reasons why this is done is because uh, if one does identify anyone, everyone, and all have an equal chance of participating, it's much easier and, in fact, it's only uh, feasible uh, to effectively evaluate and monitor the quality. But uh, of particular importance is, of course, that those who may benefit all have an equal chance of benefiting. And by identifying and, and inviting everyone, uh, this approach uh, makes the screening accessible. Now beyond that, it's also had, we've seen in the breast program, uh, a tremendous impact on the way cancer care is performed. And the reason for that is if it's population-based and if it's nationwide, then an extremely large number of professionals providing the services all over the country have to agree the protocols. And so everyone starts talking about improving the quality, not just of the screening, but also of the diagnosis and the therapy. So implementing screening nationwide in a population-based way gives a tremendous push to improving the quality of all of the services, even for those who are not diagnosed in screening. And I think this is one of the key reasons why uh, looking at this population-based approach and trying to implement it on both sides of the Atlantic could actually make these, uh, these benefits available to more people. Thank you very Thank much. You.